So one thing I found in life to be true, and I think you probably would agree with me, is sometimes it's not what you want that's important, it's what you need that's important. And I can uh, vividly remember a time in my life where I needed something. It wasn't what I wanted, but it was what I needed. Um, I had been going through a really, really rough patch, and um, it was just a, a time of pain and hurt in my life, um, um, probably one of the lower moments in my life. And I had a friend come along and say to me, hey, you need to pick yourself up, and you need to move on. And you know what? In that particular moment, it was definitely what I needed. It wasn't what I wanted to hear, but it was what I needed. But I've oftentimes found that the exact opposite is true, that, that sometimes when we're going through difficulties, that pick yourself up and, and, and you can make it and you can do it is not what's needed. Sometimes we need to deal with the emotions of what's going on. It reminds me uh, back when my mother passed away a little over three years ago, um, I was so busy um, with the church and um, so many things were going on and I, I came back and spoke a sermon as she was dying in the hospital in Asheville and then I did the funeral service and then I was back to the church and one of the things that I realized um, a year or so after that is that I never really properly grieved through that that issue and that really brings a lot of um, questions to us you know and, and since we're in our series life hacks and we're dealing with some real questions perennial questions of, of life and how do we handle them and what does scripture have to say about it I thought it would be cool to uh talk about a couple of questions that I think we all are thinking about right now and maybe don't have some of the best answers for them. The first one would be, how do we respond as Christians to a pandemic? Think about that for a minute. Um, I can tell you going to school, seminary, working on my doctorate, um, and my doctorates, um, I, I can tell you that nobody ever taught me how to deal with the pandemic. Nobody ever said, this is what you ought to do, and I suspect the same for you. But in, in dealing with things like a pandemic, um, it, it raises that next question, which is the more important question, is how do we respond as Christians when our whole life falls apart? That's it's just a, a great question and something that we should talk about. I know for many people, and you know, as a, as a pastor of a, of a church our size, um, we get the emails, we get the phone calls, um, we get the texts of, of people that are going through difficulties, that are maybe lost a job, maybe, maybe lost a loved one, or maybe they have a loved one. Um, I've been interacting with someone for a while about someone who's in the hospital with the coronavirus and, you know, and how that's gone, and it seems to have just gotten worse and worse, and you work through somebody like that, and you know, there's, sometimes we're just not really prepared for any of these things at all. And so what I want to do this weekend, and this, this came about in a strange way. This was not planned um, in, in any way, shape, or form. I'd come out of Easter, um, and as I came out of Easter, I had an idea of what I was going to do next. But I got an email from someone in the church, and they said, hey, in our group, we were reading some things and looking at some things, and this idea of lament came up. And as it came up to us, I thought, hey, maybe I should send you an email and say, hey, in the middle of all the things that we're going through, is this something that you could speak into? And it was interesting because I started thinking, wow, I haven't thought about lament in a long time. I mean, obviously, I've studied it and, and, and gone through the texts, um, gone through the Psalms. I mean, um, at least a third to a half of the Psalms are laments. And as I read that email, I started thinking, and I said, maybe this is, maybe this is something that I should talk about. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, hey, we really do need to talk about this. And so when we, when we use this word lament, you may have some ideas of what you think that means or, or what you think that word is by definition. And for the most of us, um, unless you grew up in a really um, strong Bible teaching church with maybe even an intellectual or academic background, you probably have not heard anything about lament um, in, in, a, in a church service or um, a sermon on it because um, it's not something we really deal with very well here and as, as Westerners or as, a, as Americans. And when I say the word lament, you probably think of like the definition that you would see um, in, in, a, in a dictionary, you know, the, 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 the verb form to feel or express sorrow or regret for um, to lament his absence or the noun form and expression of grief or sorrow. That's probably what you think of when you think of lament. But l lament is different in, in, in the Bible. It's, it, it certainly doesn't... Um, uh, negate these things. I mean, there definitely is a part of this to it. But scholars have, have defined three basic parts 
of a lament. Now, when I say that, there's, there's more depth and complexity as you study these things. But these are the sort of the three general um, high view of this idea of, of lament. And it's this, is that first, there is a real, honest, emotional crying out to God. That, that that's the first part that you find in the laments, is this, this, this almost um, real and raw um, crying out to God. Sometimes in ways that maybe even sounds like the, the, the psalmist is, is saying things about God that maybe you and me wouldn't say. I mean, they're, they're really, really, really honest and vulnerable in the way they cry out to God. Then, then there's somewhere in the lament, there is an asking for help. So, so there's a turn, a little bit of a pivot from sort of voicing complaint, um, argumentation, frustration, um, dejection with God. There's still the faith. There's still the crying out to God, but it's, it, but it's, it's done in a way where um, it's, it's very real and very raw. And then there's a pivot to where there's some asking for help, where, where at some point in the lament, there's this realization that, hey, we do still need God to intervene here, even though we feel the way that we do and we see things the way that we see and nothing looks really good. Um, we do need to ask God for help. And then it ends with a responding in faith with worship and trust. In other words, this, this idea that, hey, God really is God. And even though none of this makes sense, and even though I can't really quantify all of this, um, I am going to continue to worship and, and trust God. So these are sort of the elements that you have when you, when you talk about a lament. Now, I'd like to define lament for this weekend um, because what I'm hoping to do with, with every bit of my heart is to equip you. It's, it's a big deal for me as your pastor to equip saints to be able to do the things that God's called them to do. So I want to define a lament um, in the way that, that I would. Um, first of all, when we think of um, the, the, the idea of a lament, um, lamentations, which is right after Jeremiah, it's where Jeremiah laments over the um, fall of, of Jerusalem, the, the, the first words um, are how long. And when we talk about lament, there's this sense of how. How could this happen? How could a good God allow all of these older people to contract this disease and end up on respirators and dying? How could God allow these bodies to stack up in certain cities in the United States and throughout the world? How could God allow me to lose my job? How could God allow this um, problem to happen in my marriage? How could God allow this business that I put all of my hope and time and effort into, how could he allow this to, to somehow fail? And, and so this idea of how is, is really important when we study lament. So what I want to do is I want to define it, and, and, I, and I'm going to define it here um, hopefully in a way that will help us out. Uh, first of all, lamenting is far more than just being real and raw about emotions, although it includes it. The bottom line is, is it, it does include this real and raw emotive part, okay? But it's, but it's more than that. So lamenting is far more than just being real and raw about emotions, although it includes it. It is a lifestyle of applicational theology and worship that exercises our faith, reminds us of truth, and leads us to a transformed life. In other words, by not knowing the idea of lament... I think we um, will never be capable of going through the massively difficult times that are going to come. Think about it for a minute. I've heard people say, I've never seen anything like this coronavirus, never seen anything. But you know what? Back in 2008 when we were going through the economic hardship, I heard so many people say, never seen a time like this, never seen anything like this. I go back to 9-11 and people saying, I've never seen anything. Bottom line is, is that life is... Um, fraught with these issues. There, there's going to be something else. There's going to be a, a, a death in, in our life. There's going to be a tragedy in our life. There's going to be someone that, that, that's done wrong. There's going to be somebody that's taken advantage of. There's going to be a job loss, a house loss, a, a, an ailment, um, a, a disease that comes into your life. This is just sort of the part of the, the, the life that we live in. And if we're not prepared to deal with these things, which lament really is giving us that solid foundation, um, we're not going to be right. So this is sort of what I wrote down on my iPad as I was preparing for this message. And I think it's true. By not being familiar with lament, followers of Jesus are ill-equipped to adequately handle the storms, the sufferings, 
and the problems of life. And I want to I take my part um, in this and say that m- maybe I could have done a better job over the last 10 years at Grace of preparing people more for these types of situations. Um, but we're going we're gonna to deal with this, this this weekend. And this is one of those things that we might not want to hear, but it's definitely something that we need to hear. So what I did is I looked through um, the catalog of all these laments that I could have uh, talked about, but there's, a, there's one that's really, it's, it's a beautiful psalm, and um, it's very concise, and, it, and, it, and it's sort of scrunched together, but it says so many things. And so as we read through it, I'm going to make some commentary, and then what we'll do at the end, we'll come back and do some take-homes. And what I'm hoping and praying for everyone who's listening to this is that this will give you a new foundation on how to respond to the pandemic that we're in, how to respond to some of the isolation, some of the feelings, maybe some of the job losses, um, maybe some of the things that are going on in your relationships, um, people that you see that are hurting and desperate. I'm I'm hoping that this will give some really good biblical answers to those questions and, and give us that life hack for how do we deal with our world in the pandemic or how do we deal in our world is, is falling apart. So the psalm that I selected um, is a psalm of David, and it's Psalm 13. It's not very long, but it's very powerful in what it has to say. And so let's, let's work through the psalm. I'll do a little bit of uh, commentary on the psalm, and then we'll come back and we'll get to uh, um, the takeaways. And I really hope and pray that this, uh, that this speaks to you. So, so David, when he writes this psalm, one of the things that scholars do, um, we, we, we always try to figure out what was the provenance, what was the background um, what was the situation um, that, that, that uh, was the causative reason maybe for the pinning of, of a book or a psalm or whatever? The reality is in Psalm 13, we, we don't know. Um, I mean, I've got plenty of commentaries, and there's plenty of people that will chime in and tell you what they think. But the bottom line is we don't know what the reason for this psalm is. But what we do know is that we have it, and we need to look at it in its form and in its context and, and see what it has to say for you, to you and me, and then we'll make some, uh, some uh, take-home uh, applications. David starts off the psalm, and as all laments do, how long? How long, O Lord? You ever been there? I have. Lord, how long are you going to let this go on? Lord, how long am I going to have to be in this situation? Lord, how long are you going to allow these things to happen? It's a real and visceral question. In, in fact, sometimes we could look at that as maybe insulting to God. Like, you know, God, what are you doing? Like, how long are you going to let this happen? But this is the beauty of the lament psalm. It's the beauty of learning to lament. It's the beauty of learning to be honest and real with God about what's going on in your and my heart. So he starts off with four how longs. So we're going to see this word how long, or this phrase how long, four times. And every time he uses it, um, it gets worse. In other words, um, it sort of cascades down as he uses these things. And I think as I go through them, every one of you will be able to relate to this because um, they're, they're, just, they're just so real. He says, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? You ever felt like God forgot you? You ever felt like that you look around and it seems like God's very active in people's lives? But when it comes to you and me, like, he's nowhere to be found. Like, God, did, did you forget me? He can't because of his covenant loyalty. But, but David is struggling. He's struggling with, Lord, how long is it going to go here with, with you forgetting me? I mean, like, I'm here. Um, I'm, I'm calling out to you. But, Lord, I, I just I feel abandoned. Like, I, I feel like that you've just forgotten me. Like, I, I know that maybe I'm not significant in, in the eternal scope against everything else in, in the world, and, and, and I understand that I'm just a human being amidst many others, but, but I still believe that I have value and worth because you've told me that I have value and worth, and it just feels like that you have forgotten me. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? Are you going to just forget me? Then he says... The second, how long, and it goes a little bit more. He says, how long will you hide your face from me? Now, now we're not just that God sort of forgot you, like in the, in the midst of all of the um, greatness of our universe that somehow maybe we were just forgotten, which is impossible for God to do, but oftentimes we feel that way. Now David takes it a step more. 
not only have you forgotten me, but now I feel like you are intentionally hiding your face from me. Like, I know when you're looking upon me, I have the light of life. I know when you're looking upon me, I have everything that I need. But, but Lord, how long are you going to hide your face from me? Because when you hide your face from me, there's no answers. There, there's nothing but darkness. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like that God, for some reason, just isn't listening to your prayers? That for some reason, God isn't answering your prayers? D- David feels this. This is, this is why the lament psalms um, draw us in because they're so real. We've all been there. We, we've all experienced the visceral nature in our faith of wondering, God, how long are you going to let this go on? Why in the world would a good God that created the universe, that, that, that loves the way you say you love, why would you let this go on? How long, oh Lord, are you going to forget me? And how long are you going to hide your face from me? Well, it gets worse now. He says, how long must I take counsel in my own soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? What's he saying here? He's saying, I'm all alone. You've forgotten me. You're you're, you're not listening to me. And guess who now has to make all the decisions in isolation? You told me you would never leave me or forsake me. You told me that you would never go away. You told me that you would be with me. But here I am on my own, having to sort of figure this out on my own. Ever felt that way? Ever felt like that God was so distant and so out there and you just felt like I just got to handle this on my own and you just sort of do your own thing and you try to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. You try to smile. You try to get through it. David says, this is, God, I'm, I'm upset. I'm frustrated. I'm one of your children and it feels like you've forgotten me. It feels like that you're just not even listening to me, that you're hiding your face from me. It feels like you're putting me in a position where I am left to my own devices without any help from you at all. And then he says this fourth, how long? He says, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? In other words, this is as bad as it goes. Whatever this enemy was, whether it was the feeling of maybe death or or whatever that may be in David's life, he's like, are you really going to let it go all the way to where I have no victory? Like, come on. Like, you're God. I am your child. I think we've all been there. We've all been here. And, 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 and so we can all, in, in a real way, go, yeah, I, I feel that way. And maybe you feel that way right now. Maybe you're at home and you feel isolated. Maybe you're at home and you've got a sickness or a disease that you're dealing with. Or maybe you feel that maybe you have corona. Or maybe you know that you have it. Maybe you know friends that have it. Maybe you know people that have lost a job. Maybe you know people that, that, that their, their marriage right now is on the rocks because of all these things. What we just talked about is real. Like it's not, it's not imaginary. These are real issues that you and me struggle with. And David was honest with God. God, how long are you going to let this go on? But then he pivots here. He turns a little bit of a pivot and it's part of Laments, part of learning this discipline. It's part of learning how to live this way in our lives. He says, consider and answer me, O Lord my God. I love love this here. There's there's a tenderness here. Like, God, would you just consider me? Like, I know that you're God. I know that you are so above all the things of this life. But could you consider me? There's a tenderness there. And would you answer me? And I I love the faith here of, of David who is who still, even in his misery, in his plight, in his dejection, um, in all of these moments of suffering and angst and and just real and raw, visceral emotion, he says, Lord, can you consider me? Can you answer me? He knows that an answer from God is all that he needs. And he says, oh, Lord, my God. He says, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. God, I need you to answer answer me and to give me light again. He says, lest my enemy say, I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I'm shaken, because I'm slain. Um, there, there's a real pivot here. He, he, he moves from this real, honest transparency of his emotion to, to, to taking it to the depth of where it goes, to where he stops and then he turns and he pivots towards the Lord 
asking for help. And then he makes one more pivot to finish out the psalm. He says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. I've trusted in your covenant loyalty. I've trusted, even though I've been real and raw, even though I'm feeling the way that I feel, I'm pressing into you. I'm, I'm trusting in your steadfast love. He says, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. It's a, it's a beautiful juxtaposition between the enemy that will rejoice over him and that he will rejoice in God's salvation. Just a point here to make, and, and I, I, I personally believe that we need to see this. The word salvation, if you're reading it in the Hebrew text, is Yeshua. That's the, that's the word for salvation. He's, he's basically saying in advance, but you and me should read it this way, my heart will rejoice in Jesus, in Yeshua, in your salvation. And then he concludes with, I will sing to the Lord. That's future. That's not, that's not right this second. There's a future here to this. There's a faith here that I'm going to sing to the Lord. Why? Because I know he's dealt bountifully with me. He maybe doesn't see it right now, but he knows by faith that this is true. Wonderful psalm. And if we ended there, we would still be better than we were before we started. But there's so much depth, and I won't be able to get into everything, but I want to I take a few moments here and try to explain that lament lifestyle, that, that a theology of, of life, um, a theology of application in our lives when we're going through the difficult things, when we have those questions of how. And I think that what we're going through right now, there's probably nothing better than that we could learn the lament lifestyle um, to be able to get through these things so that we're equipped to be those people that go through no matter what comes our way and lives a lifestyle for his glory. So what are some things that we can take away? Well, first of all, through lament, we learn to be emotionally honest. Now, I, I can tell you in my life, um, when really bad things come, I, I've tended to downplay the emotion. I've tended to be that one that says, just pull yourself up by the bootstraps and, and keep going. And, and sometimes that is exactly what we need. But sometimes we need to be emotionally honest. Um, Christina Fox, uh, who's a graduate from Covenant um, in, in, uh, in Tennessee, and she also has her master's from Palm Beach Atlantic. She's a Christian counselor. She's also on the board at um, Covenant College um, in Chattanooga. She, she writes this as a, as a Christian psychologist. And, and I think this is very telling. She says, lamenting is an art that we don't often practice in Western culture. She's absolutely right. We just, we just don't even know it. Forget about practicing it. Oftentimes we just don't even know it, but we very rarely practice this art in Western culture. Rather than express our emotions, we tend to hide them, distract ourselves from feeling them, or even pretend they don't exist. This is, this is absolutely true. She, she's hit the nail right on the head. We, we, we tend to want to just press on and press through and not deal with some of the emotional things that are going on. And, and, and here's, the, here's one of the big problems with that is we end up talking to everybody else about our problems rather than taking them to God, which in many ways um, is a, is a built-in unbelief. And it's interesting because we can make ourselves look very spiritual when we tell everybody our problems and we, we, we tell them all of our difficulties that we're having rather than going to God. It's almost like we have a form of godliness, but we deny the power thereof because the power of God comes in spending time with Him. Lament teaches us to be honest with God, to be emotionally vulnerable. Listen, I can tell you this, not all of my feelings... Um, are based in fact, but I can tell you that all of my feelings are real and valid when I have them. Sometimes I need to hear God's word and it changes the way that I feel. But the way that I feel is the way that I feel. And what God wants you and me to do is not to hide it. He wants us to bring, he's not scared of us bringing all of our stuff to him. He's not scared of us taking all the things that we have, the struggles, the complaints, the frustrations with him. He really wants us to bring that to him because in doing that, we start to discover more who he is. I remember at Lee, Lee College when I was uh, in, in school, one of, my, one of my friends would sing this song in chapel. 
It's called Friend of a Wounded Heart by uh, Wayne Watson. And I want to read these lyrics because it, it goes back to what um, Christina had said. We, we just don't want to express our emotions. We want to hide them. We want to distract ourselves from feeling them. This is what Wayne Watson wrote in a song called Friend of a Wounded Heart. He says, smile. Make them think you're happy. Lie and say that things are fine. Hide that empty longing that you feel. Don't ever show it. Just keep your heart concealed. Why are the days so lonely? I wonder where, where can a heart go free? And who will dry the tears that no one's seen? There must be someone to share your silent dreams. Caught like a leaf in the wind, looking for a friend, where can you turn? Whisper the words of a prayer, and you'll find him there. Arms open wide, love in his eyes. Jesus, he meets you where you are. Jesus, he heals your secret scars. All the love you're longing for is Jesus, the friend of a wounded heart. You know, I remember when I would hear that song, it, I grew up in a tradition that almost said, faith it till you make it. In other words, just, just, just press on through. But the lament lifestyle teaches us that it's okay to be emotionally vulnerable. It's okay. See, lament moves us from the coping mechanisms of silence or denial, which we're really good at. In other words, just sort of hole up, don't tell anybody what's going on, don't share it, or deny it, act like it's not going on. Lament moves us from that to actually talking about it with God. See, that's what God wants from you and me. He wants us to talk about these things. He doesn't, he doesn't, I'm not saying it's bad to talk about things with your friends or your family, but that's not where we're going to find the answer. Sometimes in just letting it all hang out with God, there's a catharsis that's really good. God wants you and me to bring those things to Him. And you can see the progression here with the psalm. First of all, like, did you forget me? Like, he's honest. Like, be honest with God. You may be at home right now feeling like God forgot you. That somehow in the midst of all of this pandemic and all the things that are going on in the world, you may be saying, will you forget me forever? I mean, come on, God, are you, are you there? God wants you and me to bring those things to him. He wants to hear those things from us. And maybe you were told, you know, you just pray in Jesus' name and rebuke in Jesus' name and cast out in Jesus' name, when in, when in reality the lament lifestyle says no. God wants to hear the deepest concerns that are in my heart. Did you forget me? Or how about this one? Willfully turning away. Have you felt that way? Maybe even just lately. Like, God, you're answering other people's prayer, but it just feels like you've turned. Like, like David says here, how long are you going to hide your face from me? God, if you're not looking on me, then, then, I don't, then, then you're not shining on me. You're not answering my prayers. You're not, you're not, you're not doing things in, in, in the direction that lead me in the way that, 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 that I really want to go. Are you, are you hiding your face from me? Or how about alone? You ever felt alone? You ever felt like that God's just left you alone, that you're all by yourself? God wants you to tell him that. He, he hasn't. We, we, we know that he hasn't. We know that he'll never leave us or forsake us. But we feel as if we're alone. We feel, how long am I going to have to do this by myself? When are you going to show up, God? Or defeat? You know, How long is my enemy going to be exalted over me? See, lament allows you and me to be honest and vulnerable to God. And believe it or not, He wants that. I can tell you in my life, some of the biggest breakthroughs that I've ever had are just going and finding a place between me and God and telling Him everything that's on my heart. Being frustrated. Telling Him how I feel like it's unfair. And you know what happens? Something happens as I vent those things to God that starts to change me on the inside. Which leads to my second point here of this idea of lament, is that through lament, we start to discern the true identity of ourselves and God. I always say when Abraham prayed for Sodom and Gomorrah, he, he, he was learning more about himself than he was learning about God. 
I often find in prayer when we're, when we're challenging God and going in front of God, it starts to expose our heart and what we're more, um, what we really worship, what, what really takes priority in our lives over God. Like, God, I can't believe you allowed this to happen. You know, and it's like a car or a house or physical body. Like, those things are not unimportant, but they're not the things that our hearts should be tied to. And oftentimes as we start to confess and we start to tell God what's on our heart, what we do is we start to really find the true identity of ourselves and God. This, this is who we are, okay? Um, I, I got on my iPad and wrote this out, and, I, and I, I'm hoping this will just really settle with you, and this will, this will speak to you. Because when we, when we spend time in lament, this is what we find out. We're the fearful. That's who we are. We're the anxious. That's who we are. We're the desperate, and whatever else you want to put in there. We really are those people. While at the same time, we're the elect of God. We are those that God sent his son to die for. We're his elect. We're his children. With eternity promised to us. And our lives hid with Christ in God. That's who we are. I know oftentimes I've probably as a pastor made people feel like if they had anxiety or they were fearful or if they had some of those things that they were less than. That we all have them. They, they shouldn't control our lives for sure. And there's definitely biblical ways to go through these things. But lament allows us to be honest. I, I'm the fearful. I'm the anxious. I'm the desperate. But I'm at the same time an elect of God child of God. I, I live and you live in between the agony and the adoration. We live there. We, that's, that's who we are. When we lament, we, we come to grips that we live right here in the midst of agony, pain, and suffering, but with the adoration of the fact that God does answer prayer and God does still do miracles in our lives, but with the overwhelming sense of faith that this is not always going to be the way that it will be. Like Paul says in Romans 8.18, the sufferings of the present time, the agony, it's not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us, the adoration. And we live in that tension, and sometimes that adoration breaks in to the agony, but this is where we live. And as we lament... We, we, we come to grips with that because and, 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 this is the problem. We just want everything to go well. We just want everything to go swimmingly. You know, like, like when I was preparing this message and I, I walked through the church, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of the fact that, you know, we're not meeting and there's this beautiful building and, and all because that's what I want. But God is teaching all of us something massively here in these times. He's working in our lives, whether through the good or the bad. That's the beauty of God. He's so all-powerful that he's still working his goodness, whether in the good or in the bad. That's why, like James, when he says in James 1.3, consider it a joy when you fall into trials. Because why? Well, because God's at work in both the good and the bad. See, the lament lifestyle allows us to realize where we are, which gives us a reality check. Which, rather than just wanting everything to go well, we realize sometimes things aren't going to go good. But God doesn't change. He's God in the valley. He's God on the mountain. See, lament, just being emotional, would be pointless unless it culminates in prayer and worship as it moves our gaze from self to God. And we start to learn all kinds of things as we lament. And it's something that we need to rediscover. We probably do need to have more public times of, of confessing our sins, confessing our frustrations, confessing the things that, that bother us. Um, and, and, and I can tell you this, I'm going to try to figure out how to do a better job as your pastor into incorporating some of those things when we get back together. Because I, I think we need to really be teaching us. We, we need to be taught as people. And I need as your pastor to equip you to be able to handle whatever life throws at you. We should be able to be the people that people look at and want what we have. The third thing I will tell you is this, is that through lament, we discover the only real answer to the sufferings of this world. We all want to know why suffering. We always want to know why is this going on? How long is this going to go on? Well, this psalm is beautifully written. Um, and, it's, and it's written chiastically. And, and I've talked some about that with you all before. But, but 
the, the chiastic writing of the psalm really makes a point. And when I talk about chiastic writing, what I mean is, is that there's a start and there's an end to the text, but in the middle of the, of the whether it's a passage or a psalm or a book, there's usually something in the middle that's like the focal point of what is going on. So let's, let's look at this psalm because this is beautiful. Um, the psalm starts off in verse 1, and this is, this is the first part of the, um, the, the, the chiastic part. So we'll, we'll, we'll do this little line here because it's, it's, it's going somewhere. First verse is, how long, O Lord? That's where it starts. It ends with, he's dealt bountifully with me. And that, that's, that's our life. We experience those things regularly. How long? He's dealt bountifully. I mean, we live in between those tensions, okay? Well, what is smack dab in the middle of this psalm that, that answers these problems? Well, it's very specific, and it's really cool. Right in the center. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Right there in the middle of the psalm. What's that about? That's about resurrection. He's like, if you don't light up my eyes, I'm going to die. And if I die, then everything is meaningless. If, there, if there's nothing more than this life, than the suffering and the pains and the illnesses and the sicknesses and the chains and all of the things that we experience, if this is all that there is and then we die and we're no more, it's meaningless. David realizes that the difference between the how long, which everybody experiences, and he's dealt bountifully with me, being able to say that in faith, is this, is that he knows there's going to be a resurrection. And we as Christians know there's going to be a resurrection. See, that's the beauty of the Christian faith, is that God is a deliverer. He may deliver us now, but he will deliver us in the future. That is what gets you and me through everything. But sometimes it's a process. It's a journey. It's, it's starting off with complaining and, and, and bringing your frustrations to God, which we should. I'm encouraging you today at the end of this message, to go find a place in your house and, and, and tell God the things that are on your heart, to tell him the things that you're struggling with. But then make that pivot once you've wore yourself out from laying everything out emotionally. Make that pivot of, God, I need to hear from you, and I believe in you. See, this is the hardest part for Christians to understand. The only thing that pleases God is faith, and God puts us in these situations, he allows these situations in our lives because they're the only places that we can learn to really trust him because nothing that we see makes sense. The, the, the lamenting lifestyle teaches us. It teaches us to go to God, cry out to God, talk to him about what's going on, ask him for help, and then rejoice in faith in knowing that he is going to answer. And what is that one thing that distinguishes Christianity from everything else. It's the same thing that Paul said makes the difference. It's either true or false based on one thing, and it's the resurrection. You and me can continue to go on because we do not believe this is the final verdict of our life. There is something else coming, and I believe with all of my heart that when everything is said and done, it's bad, bad, bad English, but I really believe it, God's gonna be way gooder than we could have ever imagined. The great theologian and, and Hebraist, uh, Franz Delich, said this about this particular psalm. He says, the psalm, as it were, advances in waves as it goes through that are constantly now decreasing in length until at last it is only agitated with joy and it becomes calm as the sea when smooth is a mirror. I think if you and me can learn to adopt a lifestyle of lament. And we can learn to be honest with God and vulnerable and take those things to God and exercise our faith in Him. I think that what we'll do is we'll be able to handle a lot more of the difficulties than by just trying to smile and make people think you're happy. I'd like to lead us in a prayer. And, and I'd like to ask you at your house, because um, I, I suspect had we met this weekend and I could have preached this message, I would have had several people come up front and, and be there to pray. And I would have invited people to come up front to, to lament. And, and I personally believe, because I think we have a great church and I think you're great people, I think we would have had hundreds of people up front in the altar this weekend if we would have met in person. They would have said, you know what, I'm going to bring this lament up front and I'm going to spend some time with God. 
I'd like to lead you. I'd like to lead you and your family, you and your friends, you and your wife, you and your kids. I'd like to lead us in a prayer of lament. And I'd like for you to really make your house, your car, your iPhone, your iPad, your computer, a real place of holiness. And let's pray. And then, uh, and then we'll uh, think about these things for the, for the rest of the week. Let's pray. Father, I, I come to you right now. And Lord, I want to say that it bothers me that we're not meeting as your people. It bothers me when I see this building empty. Lord, it, it bothers me when I look around our world and see the greed and the corruption. Lord, it bothers me when I see the injustice. Lord, and sometimes I'm frustrated. I don't understand why you don't act more. Lord, I look around the world and I see the slaying of innocent children. I look around the world and I see the wars and the shrapnel of bombs and guns that leave children and young teens and adults without an arm, without an eye, without a leg. I think of all the abortions that happen in our world. And God, I sometimes I'm just frustrated. I'm frustrated, Lord, because I don't know why you don't act more. Lord, I'm also frustrated at my own sin. I'm frustrated, Lord, that I don't live out the life that I think I should. And God, I bring, we bring, is your people, all these things to you because they're real. Lord, we don't understand why there's body bags piling up in, in New York City. We don't understand why there's famine when there's plenty of food in this world. God, sometimes we just don't know why you don't act. And Lord, it bothers us. But Lord, we have nowhere else to turn. We turn to you because these are the things we deal with. But Lord, as we lay that emotion out to you, we also realize you're the only one that can do anything about it. So Lord, we come to you. Lord, we come to you and say, would you please consider us? Would you please answer our prayers? God, we want to be people that feel the pain of our world and pray for your involvement. And then, Lord, by faith, we declare that you deal bountifully with us. We say in faith that we are going to sing your praises. Because, Lord, we know that this world is not all that there is. Open up our eyes, Lord, lest we sleep the sleep of death. And, Lord, in Jesus' name, we know that you have. Because if he resurrected, so will we. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we love you for everything. In Jesus' name. I just want you to know that I love each and every one of you all. And I want you to know that our church is doing everything that we can to try to bring the best content that we can to all of you. I suspect we will get together sooner than later. At least that's my hope and prayer. But until we do, I want to remind you of these words. The best is yet to come.